the way this will work um, is I'm going to be doing the, the presenting for these webinar series, but there's a whole team of people and I really want to thank Ashley um, and the Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority for having the vision and the, all the work that Ashley's done to set this up. She's done a power of work. Um, Aaron uh, from Golden Broken CMA uh, providing the IT support. Trudy uh, here with me supplying a whole lot of support as well. So there's a whole team of people. So it's me talking, doing most of the talking, but a whole team effort. So thank you to all those people. Um, the, the seminars are um, set up so that there'll be uh, uh, some information. Uh, I'll deliver a short presentation, then we'll, we'll move into some question and answers. Um, that, that means that, um, uh, again, we can only do that through chat, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, so what are we going to cover? So the, I'll just talk a little bit more about the actual detail of how we're going to work through this in terms of the webinar process. We'll talk about the purpose of what we're trying to do with these sessions and what I'm trying to achieve with these sessions. And then today we're going to really focus in here on about language and def definitions about resilience. And it's a really key um, sort of foundational piece of, of a discussion, if you like, about what, what are we talking about when we talk about resilience? And that will be a foundation for the for the next four sessions after this. Uh, and we'll finish focusing on social ecological resilience, which is a type of resilience, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. So in terms of these um, webinars, just for your um, awareness, the sessions are going to be recorded. So if you've got concerns about your privacy, um, two options. One is you can dive out now if you don't want to be um, recorded, have your um, presence recorded in the in the webinars, um, or if you want to minimise your engagement with the chat processes that we will have going on, that's fine. If you just want to sit quietly on the sides, that's completely fine. Um, as I said, you'll be muted throughout most of the sessions and really um, we'll have a number of little interactive kind of things that will happen over the time um, and we want all of that interaction to come through the chat box. And just so that we um, have a little bit of a practice at that. What I'd like you to do now is if you look for most people that are coming in through the Microsoft Teams um, uh, application, you'll see in that little bar down the bottom, if you move your mouse around, you'll see in that little bar you've got on the right hand end, you've got a red phone. Uh, you've got some other boxes there and then you've got a little box with two people in it. Next to that box, you'll have a little, like a little conversation uh, box it's called or a, a speech bubble. If you click on that, that'll open up the chat on the right hand side. And what I'd like you to do is just type in your name, your organisation and affiliation if, if you want to, and your location so that people can get a sense of who's online, who's joining us today. So if you want to have a go at that now, I'll just let it run for a few minutes while you do that. Just a reminder, everyone, to mute if they don't mind. <laughs> Apologies, I have to be made a member to be able to do that. Me too. Me too. The message says only team members can chat. Ask the team owner to make you a member. Uh -huh. OK, so hopefully Aaron's working on that in the background. So you can see a whole range of people joining us from right across really big spread of people, people from New South Wales and South Australia, from a range of different organisations right across Victoria. Um, and it's fantastic to have this this uh, range of people and uh, lots lots of people I know and have worked with and I should also acknowledge their work uh, and the interactions. A lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about has come out of working with people right across these um, different regions uh, and different places around the country. 
Um, you can keep that going. If you haven't had a chance to put in your name and location yet, you can uh, do that anytime you like. Um, what will what will happen in terms of uh, um, you know as we work through this afterwards there'll be um, some some notes uh, there'll be any um, images any links anything that I talk about throughout these webinars I'll put those in a in a PDF and that'll be emailed out to you after we've finished at the end. We'll put a link in the chat box of a quick survey and it's literally five questions and what we'd really love for you to do is to to fill out that survey that'll give us some good feedback um, and we can use that to to target and design the rest of the the sessions as we um, design the last few we've we, we've got a rough sort of outline of what we'll talk about and what we'll do in those but we're happy to tailor it to any specific sort of um, questions or issues that people might have. So if you fill out that survey, that's your chance to sort of say how, um, how happy you are with the process uh, and indicate any of those um, specific topics that you want to talk about. Um, the purpose, what are we trying to do here is, as Ashley said, this is um, part of the process that the Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority is working through as part of the catchment uh, regional catchment strategy renewal. The Goulburn Broken has been using resilience ideas for a long time. They're world leaders in using and applying resilience concepts. And I travel to lots of places um, and, and conferences and uh, about resilience all around the world. And Goulburn Broken is really well known for the work that it's done in the past and continues to do around resilience and trying to apply resilience concepts. At the moment, as the, the catchment authority tries to um, work through this renewal process, what it's really looking to do is continue to expand and engage people in this idea of resilience. And, and so this seminar series is really um, a way to help people to get a base understanding or to improve their understanding about resilience. And by doing that, we're hoping that that allows people to engage better in that um, catchment renewal process, catchment strategy renewal process but also um, hopefully helps to give people some uh, concepts some tools, some ideas about applying resilience in their own community, in their own landscape and addressing some of those challenges um, that you face in your own uh, landscapes and locations. Uh, and as we know that, you know, the challenges that um, we're all experiencing with COVID, but particularly bushfire, we've got communities that have experienced severe drought, we've got ongoing issues in a number of communities. So. Uh, lots of challenges out there and we hope that some of these concepts, some of these discussions, some of these ideas are useful for you uh, in thinking about how you work with your own communities. Um, a little bit about me, so I live in Beechworth uh, up in the northeast. Uh, I grew up uh, between Shepparton and Kyabram on a farm there and the family's still farming there. They've been there for um, more than 150 years, been farming there. Uh, I started work as a catchment officer over in the, the Shep Irrigation region, um, working on salinity and biodiversity, those sorts of things, and working with farmers. I spent some time working in CSIRO. Uh, I worked for the Resilience Alliance, which is a, a global network of resilience um, researchers and practitioners um, that are interested in these same sorts of issues, and that's when the Golden Broken got involved in, in these concepts and we started to use the Golden Broken as a key case study site. Um, after that, I uh, worked a, a bit of time with, um, spent a bit of time working with the uh, Stockholm Resilience Centre, which is a, a centre in Stockholm in Sweden, obviously, uh, that focuses on resilience concepts and research and tries to um, turn those, re those concepts into practice. Uh, and all the time in the background, I've been working for myself uh, uh, and working with regions around Australia and communities from um, Torres Strait and Cape York right around to the Western Australian wheat belt and trying to apply resilience concepts. We've we've worked with hundreds of communities and government organisations and local governments. We've done about 800 days uh, of these types of workshops and, and capacity building with people trying to work through um, and use resilience concepts. And then the last few years I've been working as part of a collaboration with the Resilience Alliance and the Stockholm Resilience Centre to develop 
a tool called Wayfinder, and I'll put a link to that um, in the PDF that we send out, which is about trying to apply these concepts to the international development context. So we've been working in Africa and Southeast Asia on trying to apply these some of these concepts with communities there. So I'm going to try to bring um, that experience and some of those um, uh, you know, ideas that we've used that we know work consistently, that resonate with people in different places, that um, have helped people to um, uh, understand their, the challenges in their landscape, understand their communities and apply those concepts to try to improve the outcomes um, for themselves, for their communities, for their landscapes, um, uh, to move towards the sort of fairer, more just, more sustainable uh, planet and people. So that's me. Um, and so that's so over the next four weeks, I'll be just trying to bring some of those different experiences, case studies, examples, concepts and tools and try to bring it together. It's going to be fairly short and sharp and we'll have time for questions afterwards. At the end of this session, we finish at um, at 10.45, but we'll just stay online for another 15 minutes or so if there's people that just got more sort of informal questions or things that you want to cover um, at the end. So please hang around if you want to do that. Okay, so I want to jump into some content. Before I do that, I'd, I'd really like again to hear from, from you about what's your definition of resilience? So what comes to mind? It might just uh, put a word, put a short sentence, what comes to mind for you when you think about resilience? So if you want to take a, a minute or two just to do that, I'm going to play a little background, my favourite resilience uh, theme song in the background here while you do that. Still not able to use the chat function. Yeah, still can't use the chat box, unfortunately. Okay. Me either. For those, if they just want to maybe email um, back to me, Ashley Rogers, I can, um, I might not be able to capture it all in here, but for any questions later in the piece as well, that would be good. So we've got responses about bouncing back, about being able to keep going when thing, anything is thrown at you, about uh, dealing with change, about the ability to adjust about bouncing forward, which is interesting, and we'll talk more about that later. Thanks, Fiona. Um, bouncing back, ability to adapt. So being able to cope uh, with and adapt to change uh, in different situations. Grit, I like that one. So lots of different ideas about uh, resilience and and all of us know, you know, we're dealing with communities, um, dealing with the challenges that people are facing. And, and this idea of, of, if we look at the origin, this idea of um, leaping back is a really interesting one. So the word resilience comes from the Latin re, which is back, and um, salir, which means to, to sort of leap back or to leap. And so this idea of leaping back, bouncing back. Um, and then, of course, the... Um, you know, the Oxford Dictionary talks about you being able to withstand or recover quickly from difficult conditions. And so that notion, I think everyone has in their mind, is resilience is something about sort of bouncing back, coping, being able to respond um, to adverse events or when things happen to us. And of course, all of those definitions are valid. When we're trying to apply resilience concepts, though, it's important to start being a bit more specific about exactly what we mean. And so, um, if we look at the sort of common uses of the word that are around different definitions, and I'm just going to run through some of these. So if we talk about psychological resilience, um, psychological resilience is, is really about the capacities, the, the mental capacities that people have to cope with and respond with positive adaptation strategies to adversity. And so lots of people... Um, might be able to cope with with things that impact on them, things that um, challenge them. But a really key part of that is also having this this capacity to develop these positive adaptation strategies or positive adaptation actions to that <clears throat> to that adversity. So 
you know, the idea of um, just being able to cope on its own is not enough. We actually need to have strategies to help take us forward. Of course, it varies for differing adverse events. And so someone might be very resilient, psychologically resilient to something like, um, you know, the stress that drought places on them, but, but they may not be as um, resilient, psychologically resilient to something like the isolation that we're, many people are experiencing during COVID lockdown. And so depending on the type of, of adverse event, the type of stress, um, people's ability, their psychological capacity to cope varies. Um, but what we do know is that these are skills. These are skills that can be learned. And, 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 you know, for all of us with kids, you know that there's a huge emphasis in schools now on building psychological resilience. Uh, and they are skills that can be developed. And there's lots of research to back that up. If we move up sort of one level and we, we sort of think about at the personal level. And so this is a, a sort of idea about the, the psychological capacities that people have plus the other skills that people have to really navigate the world. And so it's not just about how you mentally think about things, it's the skills that you can bring together with that to obtain and navigate what you need in the world to positively adapt. And so there's this idea or this notion of what's called self-efficacy. That's your ability to, to get the things that you need um, to experience the, the well-being and the lifestyle and livelihood that you want. So it's building on that idea of psychological resilience, but it adds to it some, some skills and capacities that help you to navigate and more about the interaction with the wider world. A, a really common use of the word resilience is this idea of community resilience. And we hear that a lot, um, and we've been hearing it a lot through, particularly through things like the bushfire crisis here in Victoria, um, through the drought um, impacts right around the country. We hear a lot of talk about community resilience. There's no really clear definition about community resilience. If you go through the literature, there's lots of different definitions, but there's some core things that, that community resilience relates to. It's about organising networks of people, so not just about individuals, but the networks and the relationships within those. Um, it's about leadership, and um, out of those networks, uh, you tend to see leaders start to, to emerge that are organising and pulling people together. And, and it's about the resources that you bring together to respond to these kind of collective challenges. We know that this type of resilience, community resilience, is a key capacity in resilient in reducing fatalities and shortening the recovery time for communities. And there's really uh, lots of case studies from around the world. I was in New Orleans last year and um, you know toured the some of the devastated areas after Cyclone Katrina, Hurricane Katrina there which is now 15 years ago, and some of those communities haven't recovered still. Uh, other communities, you can't tell um, that there'd been that impact on the community. Uh, and a lot of that was put down to the community capacity, this community resilience capacity. So some communities um, were able to cope and respond very quickly and easily and recover very quickly. Others um, still haven't recovered. In the Japanese tsunami, um, there's some really clear evidence there that the, the fatality rates were actually lower in communities that had higher community resilience. And so um, these some of these capacities are actually that protective, if you like, that they can reduce fatalities even in an extreme circumstance like that tsunami. We also hear a lot of talk about disaster resilience, and there's a huge emphasis on this at the moment in Australia. The Australian government's investing very heavily in trying to understand and build our capacity to cope with disasters. Um, this is where individuals, communities, organisations and governments uh, collectively work together to anticipate, respond and recover from disasters and shocks. And I think of this as, as something, an ex expected organised response. As a citizen in a developed country, we expect this sort of thing. We expect that there will be a, a kind of a, a collective response that's organised primarily by government um, to help, uh, you know, deal with these sort of disasters and, and shocks that all communities respond to. Interestingly, in places that we've worked in, in Africa, for example, or in Southeast Asia, people don't expect government um, to step in and help. They, they have a much stronger sense of community resilience that they have to cope with it themselves. But in more developed places, it's this is something we expect as citizens that, that government um, has an obligation, if you like, to, to help um, 
to manage these sort of crises. And then finally is this idea of social ecological resilience. And this is the one that we're most interested in. This is this notion about the linked uh, connection between the social system, the economic system, the technical system, the infrastructure, and the ecological system. And for all of us living in the country, you know, we know how closely connected we are and how dependent we are on the ecosystems around us. Um, and social ecological resilience is about how those systems cope, uh, respond and recover and renew themselves in the face of these threats and shocks. And this has really been the focus of the Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority's work and the work that we've been doing and the work of the Stockholm Resilience Centre is about this connection between people and place. And this is what we'll focus in on um, over the next few weeks very strongly about this um, uh, tight interlink connection between these two. So um, when we're dealing with resilience, people will have, when we, you know, we talk about resilience, we need to start to be a bit more specific about what type of resilience. And you'll hear people mixing these types of resilience from psychological through to personal community disaster and social ecological all in one kind of sentence. So you'll hear people talk about, um, you know, I'm working with a group in New South Wales around um, community resilience and you'll hear in one sentence people talk about um, mental health, uh, farmers' ability to cope with the mental stress um, that they're under, They'll talk about community resilience, about how farmers, you know, because they're isolated from their local communities um, and stuck working on the farm, feeding stock or whatever it is, um, the struggle that they have coping with the, with uh, drought um, and also talking about this kind of connection and identity, this idea down the bottom here about um, social ecological systems, about the importance of place. And you'll hear that language, you'll hear those concepts get um, intertwined uh, together and that that's fine, but we do need at times to be more explicit so to separate out. And so obviously, um, you know, we need to, if we're trying to plan a response, are we talking about disaster resilience? Are we talking about um, how people are coping psychologically? Of course, those things are always going to be, um, you know, occurring at the same place. But when we're talking about trying to work with or, or um, designing programs or projects to, to help people in these places, it's really useful to separate out which one of these are we actually talking about. And they come with different concepts. They come with obviously with a different um, uh, you know, scientific basis. They come with a whole range of different tools, that sort of thing. And so it's quite useful to talk about it. So if we go back to our, our definitions here that we talked about right at the start, I would add to these um, a couple of really important points. One is that at this different, these different scales from the, the, the psychological, uh, the personal, right through to the community groups of people, uh, through to whole systems kind of thinking. So when we talk about resilience, it's, it's important to identify and recognise those different scales. And I would also um, add to that this idea of the... Um, renewal of the system and so it's not just about bouncing back it's actually about the system being able to renew itself about the system being able to um, cr be creative in terms of adapting and or transforming where it needs to so this idea of social ecological systems as i said it's really important for um from a a, a planning perspective for the golden broken catchment management authority it's important for um, organisations like local government and government agencies that are thinking about um, managing issues in the landscape because this is the sort of core idea about how people and place are connected. And we'll talk more about this next week, but this notion of people and place and identity, the identity that forms around that connection between people and place is really fundamental. And what I'd like to do now is just to to try to tease that out a little bit is um, for those of you that can use the chat function, I'm conscious that some people can't, but for those of you that can, I just want you to do this little exercise, <clears throat> which is after you've been away, so being away from your home and you're coming back and you're getting back near your home, I want you to just um, 
think about and close your eyes if this helps. And if we were doing this face to face, I'd be asking you to close your eyes and to take a minute just to think about this is to think about what are the things that tell you you're back near home? So what are those things that help you um, know that you're home, that you're back near home? So just take a minute to think about it. So a whole range of things here, gum trees, I feel safe, a change in thinking that comes about. The landscape, the mountains, I can see the familiar landscape, the landscape identifiers. I can feel I can breathe. The landscape, the landscape, the trees, the river, the landmarks, the familiar landscape, the iron barks, they create an arch over our road. thinking about all the chores I've got to do. Yep, the vegetation changes, past memories, knowing the names of, of neighbours. Some of the smells, the birds, uh, it's familiar, irrigation farms, trees, the river, landscapes and feeling I can com relax completely. The potholes, <laughs> going over the Murray River. The lights for me, yeah. feeling of being safe, relief, seeing the hills and the creek. And I noticed that no one said when I'm back in the Strathbogie Shire, when I cross the boundary of the Shire, or when I re-enter the city of Shepparton, um, we don't identify with lines on maps, we identify with the landscape. And this is a really key idea about identity and this idea of connection to place. And we know for Aboriginal people and Indigenous Australians, this idea of connection to place uh, and connection to country is absolutely core, is fundamental to their identity. Uh, and for the rest of us, I think we, we have a sense of that, of that when we're starting to come back into our place we know. And, um, and I'm often struck by just how sophisticated people's understanding or feeling of that sense of home and places. What you're describing is a core part of social ecological systems. You know, that's a bit of jargon, of course, but, but that idea, that notion is absolutely central to this idea of social ecological system, the sense of belonging to place, of knowing a place, of feeling safe, um, is really fundamental. So going from a very a personal level now to a to a, a, a more technical level. Um, social ecological systems, this idea of people in place actually has a whole theory behind it, a whole set of ideas that we can draw on to help us think about the way people and place interact and how they change. And it comes from the science of complex adaptive systems, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but just three really key points I want to touch on is one is around the idea of interdependencies. Um, you know, we are dependent, all of us, every human on the planet is dependent on ecosystems, on the resources, on the benefits that ecosystems provide to us from, you know, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, but also from its, um, its cultural, uh, its its um, spiritual kind of um, influence on us, the mental health benefits from being in nature, all of those things, we get these incredible benefits from nature. Um, but also nature can be dependent on us and in terms of um, the way that we manage and use um, and interact with nature and the way, you know, things like traditional burning and fire management, those sort of things, and how um, there's a relationship between how we interact with the landscape and the benefits that we get back from it. Some of this science around complex adaptive systems can help us think about some of that stuff. Systems go through patterns and cycles of change, and um, and we'll talk a lot about that next week, but but that helps us to think about the future and, and to think about the ways we might need to prepare for an uncertain future. And these systems have limits and tipping points in them. And those tipping points mean that the system can change quickly in unexpected ways, and so that creates surprises. Uh, it could create some uncertainty about 
um, the future and how we manage that and how we prepare for it. And we'll talk more about that next week. OK, so starting to sum up, we're going to wrap up fairly soon. But so there's this question really around, um, you know, bouncing back or are we really on about bouncing forward? And I want to sort of put the uh, the statement to you really that the way we should be trying to think about resilience now in this, the world that we currently live in, is that we should really be trying to focus on bouncing forward. Uh, so we'll use this definition here that um, we'll talk about over the next few weeks. So the resilient, you know, resilience is the capacity of a system to cope with change. And we're talking about a system here, the social ecological system, people and place to cope with change and develop in a desired way. And that includes this idea of maintaining or building the potential to creatively adapt. So it's not just about bouncing back to where we were, but um, a really key point I want to stress here is we actually can't go back. Once a system has experienced a change, a shock, um, you know, you can never go back to exactly how it was because for the simple fact that you now have the legacy of that impact in the system and you've got that experience you've had that legacy and impact um, both mentally physically physically in the landscape it impacts on our you know um, on our infrastructure on our livelihoods etc all of those things means that we never actually bounce back to exactly how we were so i'd really like to challenge us and stress to us to think about this idea of bouncing forward not back and think about this the need to um, maintain the ability to continue to be creative about the future uh, and also where we need to to transform which is about creating a fundamentally new identity and we'll talk more about that next week okay so <clears throat> that's all the material i was going to talk about today so just as an introduction next week we'll go into more detail about social ecological systems and we'll delve into some some detail about um, particularly about the cycles and patterns of change. For now, um, I'm just wondering whether people have any particular questions or comments or reflections on today's session. Don't forget there'll be the survey if you've got more general sort of things, but if you've got a question for myself or um, for Ash about the, you know, the catchment management um, uh, process that they're working through about the renewal of the catchment strategy or about any of the, the detail here. So just a question there. So Catherine, yeah, we will provide, um, after each session, we'll provide a, a PDF of the key um, slides, images, et cetera. We'll, I'll put links. Anything else that I think is relevant from the discussion um, we'll include uh, in, in that PDF, which will come out after the session sometime this week. I should have mentioned at the start, these um, sessions, they're being recorded because they're going to be put on the Goulburn Broken Catchment Management Authority website. So I'm not exactly sure when that'll happen, but we'll let you know when they have been posted. Any other questions or comments that people would like to make before we, we draw things to a close? Still can't use the chat there. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. That's a problem. We'll try and sort that out before next week. You can call your question out if you'd like. That's OK. okay. Tracy, so you're looking for a, a, a fairly straightforward way to um, to explain resilience. Um, I, I would hope, Tracy, that at the end of this, you feel confident to to explain resilience to your community. Um, and I think that's really important that it's it's people explaining it to their community. It's OK to have someone come in from outside, but I think the best thing is if you can develop a way of, of doing that yourself um, and using this material. And I'm happy to have a chat with you about um, some of the materials, some of the ideas that, that we use to try to, um, you know, explain and think about this sort of, of stuff. So I'm happy to do that after. Um, so
So just a question from Monique uh, about thinking about resilience as bouncing forward. Resilience could really be defined as <clears throat> adaptation to change. That adaptation, um, Monique, adaptation is certainly part of it, but um, we'll go into this in more detail next week, but <clears throat> also part of it are the ability to just persist. So there are times when we really just want to persist. We might just want to be able to survive through something um, and persist and come out the other side and continue on. There are other circumstances where we'd want to adapt because we don't want to just bounce back to the same situation if that situation is going to make us vulnerable to the same thing in the future. So adaptation um, can take on two forms. Adaptation can sort of keep you just adapting and staying in the same place, if you like, or adaptation can be more creative and, and take you forward. So I, I separate out those two things and I talk about reinforcing adaptation and creative adaptation. Um, and there might be times when you just want to do that reinforcing adaptation, which is about sort of incremental change. But there might be other times when you really want to set yourself up to move in a different direction or move away from that vulnerability. There's also um, this idea of transformation, and I'll go into this in more detail next week, but transformation is about a much more substantial shift. It's about a shift in identity. So adaptation, um, if, if you don't have the capacity or if your capacity to adapt gets exceeded, in other words, by the sort of pressures or the shocks from outside, just adapting incrementally just may not be enough. You might need to think about a more fundamental substantial shift which is about transformation so we can talk about some of that next week <clears throat> um, so a question from megan if you say systems cannot bounce back to the same do you think this applies to ecological systems or mainly human constructs i i actually do think megan that um, ecological systems can bounce back um, but they never bounce back to exactly how they were. They always have the legacy of those those shocks in them, and that expresses through things like <clears throat> age structure of of vegetation. It expresses through the changes in species diversity uh, and abundances and things like that. And so, over extremely long periods of time, you might say, yes, this is very similar to what it was, but. Um, given the rates of other changes that are occurring around ecosystems, and the obvious one is to do with climate, is that can we really expect ecosystems to just bounce back when you've got a climate over the top that's shifted by maybe a degree or more um, in many places? And, you know, CSIRO modelling around um, the degree of ecosystem change, ecological change as climate changes, would suggest that um, as ecosystems are recovering now, they're, they're being subjected to very different pressures. And so I don't think you could expect them, any ecosystem now, to recover to, to exactly what it was before, in, in a sense, because the context has changed. Okay, so just last few questions. We are going to sort of wrap up at, at 10.45. So, um, and a question about um, what scale can we hope to develop resilience, personal uh, resilience? And uh, it's a it's a really good question. <clears throat> uh, so I I believe you know we we can't have resilient communities without resilient people. That you know communities are made of people. So clearly we need people to be. Um, able to cope and we know that people are under enormous pressures and uh, you know my travels and work all over the place around the planet is that there's a really consistent sort of feel that people are under pressure and under stress and and we see that expressing terribly in some of our communities here recently with the bushfires and we're seeing it right now with with COVID and all sorts of things and the challenges that people are facing so we need but we need resilient people and we need resilient communities um, to be able to manage and be part of resilient social ecological systems and so the reality is we need resilience at all scales and the work that i've been doing over the last 15 years or so in this area um, you know i'm having to learn 
uh, much more about personal resilience because the conversations I'm having now are very different to the conversations I was having 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and every conversation now about, you know, dealing with social ecological resilience, this overall system resilience idea, now inevitably leads to a conversation about community resilience and about personal resilience and about psychological resilience. Um, and it's it's shocking. I find it quite shocking. And and um, you know the the rates of mental health issues that we see in communities and small communities and um, you know it's it's a it's a concerning issue. For, I think that all Australians should be should be worried about. But what we do know is that connecting people, working together, um, uh, talking about. Um, ways of improving um, our lives, improving our communities, of working together on those things actually does help people um, at the personal level and at the psychological level. And so that they're not mutually exclusive. Thinking about, you know, system resilience, social ecological system resilience is not mutually exclusive from talking about and thinking about um, personal and, and psychological resilience. And so we need to think about and work across all of those scales. Um, we're we're going to wrap up there. So I'm really conscious we said 10.45 is when we'd finish. I'm going to stay around here for another 15 minutes or so if people want to, um, and particularly people I'm aware that people who couldn't get into the chat function, if you if you want to now, you know, jump in with a comment or a question, um, you know, using your microphone, um, feel free to do that. Just last couple of messages. Um, from me is that we would really love you to, to do the um, the survey. It should only take you a couple of minutes, and that will help us to to formulate the, the next sessions. We, like I said, we've got an, an outline, but we want to really make sure we're meeting the needs that that you've got. Um, so if you could do that, so that's posted into the chat box there now. So it's just a survey monkey. So if you click on that, you'll be able to do that. It should only take you a couple of minutes. Other than that, thank you. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next week. And like I say, I'll just hang around here for another 10 or 15 minutes or so. If people have got questions, comments, um, feel free to jump in. Thanks, folks. Uh, thanks, Paul. And just Ash here, I will email that survey link to you in case you're having trouble accessing the chat um, function. So. And we'll try and improve our technology <laughs> by next week. We're learning. We're learning. Yes. We're all learning. Oh, I thought it was done particularly well. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. Thank you. Um, particularly like um, differentiating between the ty types of resilience, it does all get meshed together and it's very different. So, um, yeah, loved it. Really yeah. well done, I think. Wonderful. Great. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, folks. Yep. And look, if you've got comments or questions, um, by all means, just um, <clears throat> uh, there's the space at the bottom of that survey for anything else you'd like to to um, cover or add in. We can um, make sure we're addressing some of those questions next week that we didn't have time to deal with today. I saw a really cool diagram using a marble as a way of showing that you can have multiple states. Is, do you find that one useful or confusing? Uh, I like it. Yeah. I do like it. So that's a really the, the idea of kind of changing. Um, it's called basins of attraction. Um, yeah. And well, it that, used to be stable states, I think, and then they yeah. changed it to persistent states. And then they, yeah, okay. Because I was having a look at that and wondering if that was a useful way to draw some different sort of um states sorry what were you saying yeah. yeah no that's that's right and it's look it's it's useful it's um it works for some people it's a metaphor and like yeah. all metaphors you know it works for some people and some people find that really powerful and some people just don't get it at all and yeah. okay. that's fine it's just the way people different you know brains work um but i will do a little bit of that uh, yeah, next week and and talk a little bit about that, the idea of sort of changing states and things like that.
Looking forward to it. Yeah. <clears throat> it's um, Brad Costin here. How are you? How are you? G'day, Brad. How are you going? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. I, I, I remember you from many years ago in a previous life at, um, and we both went along to a Whiteheads Creek land care meeting. I think it was in your CMA role. Yeah, many, right. Many, yeah. many, many years ago. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's like 25 years ago. Yeah. yeah. I've got a feeling we went to uni together too, Brad. Oh, did, you go to, um, did you go to um, Rusden or Deakin? Oh, I did go to Rusden, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. I think I was a year, maybe the year ahead of you or behind. But anyway, yep. There you go. <laughs> no, I just want to say that was great. And uh, yeah, it's been quite a while. So you've obviously uh, moved around a fair bit. But I, I do, I have read a lot of those resilient, um, resilient um, uh, sort of resources and books that have come out over the years. And um, yeah. yeah, so it's good. We just, yeah, it's good to see this type of um, um, you know, effort sort of adding um, adding to those resources, which is great, sort of makes it a bit more lifelike and relevant. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, look, everyone knows these. there's nothing new in these concepts in a way, but just helping to sort of formalise it a bit, structure it a bit for people, and, um, I've, and we've learned a lot, you know, and we've learned a lot from working with people like you and, and the, you know, people at the CMA and it's it, it, this is an evolving thing. No one's got it right. I work with people all around the world doing this stuff and it's like no one around the world has kind of nailed how to how to make, you know, people and places resilient. There's, there's all different, you know, look at what's happening in the US at the moment, you know, the most so the supposedly advanced country on the planet suffering terribly because of a lack of um, preparedness and a failure of institutions and all sorts of stuff. Um, so, you know, we're learning as we go and and all I'm trying to do is bring the experience that we've got and just bring it forward and carry, you know, bring other ideas from other places so that we can draw on it, particularly as the CMA goes through this, goes through this renewal process. It's like, what can we learn? And I, I, I keep saying to people, it's kind of circular because a lot of the ideas that are really strong now in resilience actually at least some of them had their origin partly in the Golden Broken mm, so yeah. many years ago, you know, a, a lot right back in those days when, you know, you, you were talking about some of those ideas actually fed into that uh, into that network of people and then they turned it, turned it and turned it around and brought it back to, um, you know, and we're, I'm sort of back using those ideas now. So that's not much new in the world. Right. No, no, I look forward to it. So, um, thanks. 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 No worries. Good on you. Thanks, Brad. Any last questions from anyone before we uh, wrap up today's session? We must have explained it well, Paul. <laughs> fine. All right. Well, we might call it quits. So thanks, folks, and we'll see you hopefully next week.